Hello movie lovers in Austin, Texas and everywhere around the world, it's Baron and the Doc here. Today we are reviewing Two Deaths of Henry Baker. That's right, and this show is called That Reminds Me Of. We're a little podcast that reviews films, watches films and talks about them really, and then the, we talk about the films that we're reminded of after we watch that film. Very heavy on spoilers, so if you don't like spoilers, just be aware we're going to get right into the nitty gritty of the film and um, switch off now, or else if you're happy, continue listening. Well, speaking of spoilers, um, Two Deaths of Henry Baker sounds like a spoiler, doesn't it? Just straight off the bat. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> So this is this is the second film that we're, we've enjoyed from the Austin Film Festival in Texas, enjoying it virtually from Melbourne, Australia. Two, two films in, how are you feeling about the festival, Baron? Well, I think we've got ourselves, as we were talking about in the last episode, we have another film that is quite indie. Um, I did watch some of the Q&A afterwards and saw that, that they did this in 16 days mm. and they... Um, I, there was no talk of budgets that I that I caught anyway, but um, you got a real sense that it was a tight budget and um, mostly raised by the writer and star of the film, by the sounds of it. Yeah, that that, that Q and A really is a great feature of the festival, and I think I enjoy it even more virtually because you get to see them up close. You feel like you're in the room with the with the filmmakers, so I really enjoyed that, and it. it added a lot to the experience after the film. That writer uh, is Sebastian Pickett. Pickett? Pickett Pigot or Pickett? <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> he's a cool dude, though. He's good. He, he's a cool dude. He also plays Hank in the in the film mm. itself, and I think he does a solid job. But before we get into any of that, we need to give the audience a synopsis of the two deaths of Henry Baker. Do you want to take it away, Doc? Uh, I always get the hard one. I'm sure I get the hard ones. <laughs> It just works yeah, out that way. Last episode, you got Murderberry Win, which is you know you could um, Easy. write the synopsis on the back of a <laughs> of a Monopoly card. Right. This one not so not so easy. Um, as the title suggests, this is a story about Henry Baker, who's some sort of an outlaw, and he. It, it starts off actually in 1958, where we get a bit of his backstory, where his father is is a. Burying some treasure was he burying or digging up? I can't remember. Uh, he was burying. A, he was burying a bag the of treasure. coins. Yep. Burying his son's super, um, <laughs> his nest egg, uh, and so we get introduced to the to the fact that yeah, what, what the treasure is, and uh, we we also get introduced to the fact that he that Henry has a half brother I think who named Sam Bird. Um, and that's pretty much that 1958 story, just setting that that backstory scene. Then we go straight into 1988, and you're confronted with an old older guy um, who is being held hostage in a in a chair, and you know, in a give us the money type stuff, or where is the money? Um, questions with by the by the sheriff, who seems like a, a slightly dodgy type of sheriff. We discover that it's Henry ba Henry Baker. But then, no, it's not Henry Baker. It's actually Sam Bird, who looks exactly the freaking same as Henry Baker. And we only know this because then Henry Baker arrives and says, no, oh, I don't even know how it goes, but um, he, he, <laughs> yeah. Henry Baker rescues Sam Bird. We, we might have to stop at this point of the synopsis because am I right in thinking then Henry Baker kills Sam Bird or we're no. led to believe? Yes, yes, that's right. So... You're right. No, Henry Henry Baker takes his then young young son and Sam, his brother, mm. at, out to a bridge and shoots Sam in the in the, the stomach a couple times. Falls in the water, leaves him for dead. Good. Okay, I just yeah. wanted to get that straight because maybe we'll come back to that. Yes. <laughs> then then we travel to 2008. Yeah, right. It's um, another 20 year leap or or so. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a 30 year leap. Yeah, and. Um, Henry has been in jail for 25 years um, and is finally coming out and there's there's a few new characters brought into the mix. His son has grown up living a comfortable life with a wife and child uh, and his name's Hank. And Sam Bird's son is also around the traps. He's kind of a, a grifter, gigolo type character. Yeah. And um, he... Also named Sam, right? 
also named Sam, like his father, mm -hmm. and he's not too happy with how his life's gone and the fact that this Henry character killed his father. So he's orphaned. Henry Henry goes, basically wants to recover his money. Then, all of a sudden, the twist, Sam Bird comes back from the dead, um, confronts Henry Baker. They sort of have it off, and we end up having a situation where Sam Jr. kills his father, thinking it's Henry Baker. Right. Everyone else friggin' dies from memory, but um, I'm missing some plot points, but do you want to fill them? Well, no, I think that those are the main plot points. Major note, though, for those who mm. haven't seen it yet, or, I mean, hopefully you have, but um, Sam and Henry Sr. look the same. They're played both played by Gil Bellows, mm. same actor. So the idea of mistaking Sam and Henry, totally plausible because they, they look exactly the same. The idea of mistaking them, yeah, is totally plausible. The idea that they look exactly the same, perhaps not so plausible. Not so plausible because like, they're like not exactly twins, exactly are the they? Same. I think no. at one point someone says they could almost be twins, <laughs> you know. And yet I don't think they're even, I don't think they share parents, do they? I got the feeling that they did, although it was a little unclear about their heritage. Mm. It's, it's a lot clearer about their kids. So Hank and Sam Jr., like you get yeah. it, you, that set up is really clear, like who their parents are. Sam's got a mum who's a druggie uh, mm. or at least an alcoholic. Um, and there's a real kind of Oedipal thing happening there. And mm. uh, Hank, he's uh, he's been on his own this entire time, uh, basically with a bag full of gold coins or bullion or something. I don't know. I don't know why these coins are so valuable and why everyone wants them. That's never explored. Even yeah. what kind of coins they are. Like you never see one up close. It was killing me. I really wanted to know what these things were, but they're valuable. Let's put it that way. Yeah, it's odd, isn't it? Because um, Sam Jr. has four or five of them and, you know, they keep getting pawned probably by his mum, yeah. I think. Um, and then he buys them back for 200 bucks. Um, so in that sense, they don't seem to be of absolute value. They're not like the crown jewels. No. And yet everyone in the film is is after these, you know, these things. And, and it's given Hank this prosperous life because he's just gradually um used it to um use his super to get his house and live a nice, Buy a life. nice house and all that yeah, yeah. Have, have a good truck i think those are the main plot points and there's a lot of intricate plot points mm. to this film um but you know shall we get into some of the details of what works and and what doesn't yeah Was there anything I, that stood I'd love out you, to you i'd Doc? love you to get started on that i think okay. you've got a fair bit to say on this film yeah, I do. So I overall really enjoyed the film. I think that, again, ambitious, very ambitious, mm. low-budget film. There's a lot happening in this film that you, that they had to pull off, um, more so than Murderberry Wind, which is the last film that we saw. Once again, you know, and you have to let it, let some of it slide, but there were, there were sort of technical issues, um, mm. and particularly with the edit and the cinematography, that and the, like basically the way it was shot and pieced together that bothered me about the film that I think held it back and it was it felt like it need it could have been tighter mm. could have been shot differently uh, which is a big note that's really that's a tough note to deliver but when you're on a tight schedule you know sometimes you shoot things certain ways just because you have to right yeah um, but I I had this constant feeling of like oh I want the camera to be over there I, wh why are we here this feels odd to me you know what I mean. Ah, um, okay. And then on the flip side of that, the most incredible soundtrack, just a banging soundtrack that like, I just wish that the direction of the whole film was as good as the direction of the soundtrack because it just would have been incredible. The, the soundtrack is just off the charts good. That's the second great soundtrack of because like, you enjoy the, the previous one. Although this, this had a real Americana, swampy, um, gritty vibe didn't it it's yes. it really brought it together totally i so i kind of enjoyed the soundtrack from murderberry wind because i think it was trying to elevate the film mm. this i feel like this soundtrack could live in a top of the list sort of film like it was just so good that in a way was a juxtaposition against the rest of the film like i was listening to this soundtrack and loving it and just wishing that everything else came up to the level of it i am um, i loved the soundtrack i thought that was the standout character in it but the, I, I really loved a lot of things about it as well like uh, Gil what's Gil's surname I've had a blank. Bellows Gil Bellows who's the most known actor in the film 
um, the, the draw card. I think he does a great job on Sam and Henry. He reminds me so much of Jack Nicholson. He did to me as well. Yeah. Big time. And there was a whole, there was a real Jack Torrance shining vibe going on at times as well, where it looked like he was about ready to, you know, take out the family. Yeah, I, I, um, I really enjoyed his performance. Like sometimes... I'm going back on that a bit, a little. Sometimes the distinction between the two characters was was bang on, and other times I got got a little bit lost in it. But I, I guess that's the point, I suppose, because you meant to not know who's who sometimes. Yeah. So I was of two minds. I think I've I've seen him as an actor deliver better performances mm. in other in other shows and and films, um, some great shows and films. So. I was torn a little bit because I didn't feel like this was his best performance. But Mm. at the same time, playing a twin basically in the same shot, acting (laughs) off of nobody or somebody else, uh, and then having that stitched together is is a, isn't an easy thing to pull off. And I think he did a he did a fine job of that. Uh, th- were there any big things that you? I don't know whether to start on on liked or, or disliked, but mm. liked. Like what what else did you like other than the score? Well, I thought that Hank, the, the who is the writer of the film as well, mm. I thought his character was uh, probably the most intriguing character in the mix. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm doing like and dislikes at the same time here. I did that before as well. I think I'm <laughs> going to be with you, what you said, with what you say here. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think it was the least developed character in the film. It was so strange. Like it had the mm. most promise of being the character of this whole thing. And yet doesn't deliver on that it's it's very underdeveloped uh and and considering he's the kid at the beginning mm. of that 80s section portion of the film who basically runs off with a bag full of coins after um watching his dad go down mm. has the gumption to burn the car and then basically raise himself um with this treasure that mm. is an amazing character you know, like I just expected a lot more to come out of it. But I thought the performance delivered mm. when Sebastian Pigo was doing, mm. that's probably terribly pronounced, but <laughs> I thought he was great. Yeah, he he was great. And it, it was just, it was strange, the character arc, wasn't it? Because there was so much set up. There was so much um, capital in the character that could have been spent. Uh, and then it, it almost like uh, just deflated at the end it went the other way he ended up being quite i wouldn't say shallow but he just you know spent the money on life's little luxuries you know there was no it just ended with a his character ended in it with a whimper Mm -hmm. all these bold people you know doing crazy things all around him and he never really made an impact on the um on the storyline or his life did he not really, no. And to just maybe that's of, the point. Maybe that is the point, and and that is a great. That's something that I wanted to ask you about, because the whole way through the film, I was basically saying to myself, "What does this film mean? What mm. are we being? What are we being told here through this story of three generations?" What was your take on it? I mean, I had some guesses, but I'd love to know what your take on it was. I had the same question for you. I I don't think it told me much at all really other than sins of the father you know coming to the son and the masculine relationships that we've talked about a lot and a lot of thematic things throughout the throughout the film but no end moral or message i didn't mind that so much i have to say like i thought the journey of the film was really really cool and i enjoyed watching all the characters and i almost didn't mind that it didn't have a a strong for me sense of purpose or even structure or anything like that it, it made me i was always intrigued through the whole thing because it just wasn't following normal patterns i think i was bothered by it uh but you i, I suppose right now in my world like i'm kind of just going deep on theme at the moment in mm. my own work and so i was sitting here thinking well what is the theme here and wouldn't this wouldn't this film just be better if they had kind of nailed that down mm. and there were there were loose ones cut popping up like you know obviously there's there's something about a curse of treasure like this whole 
bag full of gold, right, or whatever it is, is ruining generations of this family. Mm. But then at the same time, is that just the greed of men? Does it have nothing to do with the treasure? Or is it like a cycles of criminality passed down through the generations that, you know, like what what are we and it just felt like none of those things were really decided upon they were all kind of in there but there wasn't like one really strong theme that would tie it all together and just like just be a punch in the gut towards the end of the film yeah completely agree that there's no no unifying concept just a whole lot of emotions and stories that sort of uh converge here's a here's an early reminds me of for you then just yeah. popped into my head we talked about a film recently that we, we, we nailed this exact same issue down, like yeah. sort of what was the actual message here? Uh, and I'm just, oh, I'm blanking on the name of it. What's the I'll, what's I'll, the I'll tell you the name of it. Tell um, me. It's called The um, Devil All the Time. Yes, The Devil All the Time. And that was going to be one of my reminds me of. So you've, oh. you've taken it away. But the, <laughs> Sorry, dude. There's, there's so many similarities because in that film, you do start with the, the backstory of the father and the son. In much mm. much the same way, so in that case it was Spider Man, Tom Holland. Yes. Um, and in this case it's um the the writer Pig Pigo or Pigot Pigot. <laughs> yes. Sebastian. Yeah, and in in both the, the, trying to find a through line is just very very difficult. Yeah. So in the Devil all the time, it's religion, mm. and in this it's a bag of gold. Um, you, they both have the father son passing down torment and sort of cycles of abuse in some ways there was one maybe i'm going to put my finger on it a little bit here one character who i don't think you really properly get the motivation for so you you do for a lot of them like you do with sam bird who's out for revenge Mm -hmm. you know because he got killed by his brother supposedly um the hank is longing to see his father again yeah uh the sam bird jr um, you know, uh, wants revenge for his father's death. Henry um, himself, mm. I'm not sure what drives him. Like, we don't really get to know him at all. Uh, he's just this, this mystery in the middle of it. Yes, and everyone's scared of him. He's mm. supposedly a badass that everyone should be scared of. That's all you get. Yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's a great point. When he finally does get out of jail, he's just destroyed so quickly by his brother. And so effortlessly, it seems. Yeah, it's a good, it's it's a great point. What do mm. you make, if anything, of the title of the film? You know what? I haven't really thought about it too much, but the two deaths of Henry Baker is it because they're both? Because oh, is, is Hank a Henry as well? I mean, is, is it that simple that you've got Henry Senior and Henry Junior both getting killed? Hmm. It reminds me of um, the 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 killing of two lovers mm, yeah. as, a ti- as a title because it, yeah. it's you know is a supposed spoiler straight away, but then it doesn't necessarily tell you anything. Yes, and the, um, but the killing of two lovers is so uh, clever for the theme of the film, isn't it? Mm. Do mm. you know the um, uh, the two deaths? I think comes from a a quote which is attributed to Hemingway. Um, it goes something like that you everyone dies two times um you know once when they actually die and, and the mm. second time when their their name is last spoken yeah you i've know. heard that one yeah that's great i think banksy also has done a version of it you know that that's all about legacy uh i i suppose and yep. um you know being immortal in the in as long as you're you're known to me that because it's in the title i was looking for meaning in something along those lines i'm not sure i found it though yeah no i i didn't even really think about it that much but that's a that's that's a cooler idea i like that i didn't have much more that really stood out to me i loved the moment when sam re- like arrives back in the mm. sam senior arrives in the hotel out of nowhere i thought that was a great twist because you have been waiting for henry baker to come out of jail and to mm. shake things up and he just doesn't get a chance. I thought that was good. Yeah, yeah. And I think I, I like that. I probably was criticizing it kind of before that we, we didn't know much about him. But mm. maybe that's the two killings that we don't really know much about this man. He's 
he's um dead and now he's forgotten yeah um i suppose uh but yeah the sam bird character was a lot more interesting absolutely actually kind of a um assassination of jesse james situation there i don't know if you've ever seen that i don't don't think i've seen it um by the by the cow coward robert ford is that yeah that's right yeah. yeah So, I mean, you can think of him as as the Robert Ford character. I think there was a lot of influence from those sorts of films sprinkled throughout this one. Mm. That was the biggest takeaway for me, that this was a very ambitious, low-budget version of that kind of film. And I thought, for one, I think that's a clever thing to do if you're going to make a low-budget film, um, to, to pick a little shitty town in the middle of nowhere mm-hmm. in the US and and which is probably just filled with just great locations off the cut, like just naturally just happening. Yeah. Um, and, and make a little dirty interpersonal kind of thriller thing like this is really cool. Really cool idea. Did I think the characters will, will stay with me for a while. I don't think mm. I'll forget this film. That's saying something to me. Yeah, totally. Same here. There's so much in this. It's strong. And once again, a, very similar to Murderberry Win. Like I just would love to see I would love to see more money thrown at a project like this and what could be achieved. And maybe that's that's a theme that's coming out of this festival, you know. Early on, we've still got a lot of films to see. The festival seems to be championing films with clever scripts and premise premises mm. that have been done on a pretty small budget and uh and yet they've managed to pull off the film and get it out there into the world and i think if that's what austin film festival is about and that's what they're doing that's a pretty great thing because you don't normally get a chance to see these films yeah and i i'm i really like it i'd almost go opposite to you a bit i don't don't necessarily want them to throw more money at it because i i think sometimes when you start throwing money at things the you know it can get rid of a bit of that energy and i thought this film had had energy mm, um it's true. and for for some flaws fine but on a on a 16 day shoot they really crammed in a lot of great performances a lot of a lot of great themes even if they weren't unified yeah um a great soundtrack um and a f- film that i think it, they should be proud of so shall we move on to any more reminds me of that we haven't already mentioned because we've mentioned a couple already uh yeah well the devil all the time you you took mine Um, i stole it from you sorry so it's call call that mine and then have you got have you got any no i think i i um i thought of old country for uh no country no country for old men thank you um no country for old men pops into my head uh so did hell or high water just as examples of these kinds of films that done really well on mm. bigger budgets, clearly, and justified as a as a TV show that sort of felt like it was in a similar world as well. As well. Justified? I don't know Justified. It's a Timothy Oliphant show, okay. which is just really fun to watch. Okay, I'll, I'll, we'll add that to the homework episode. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was reminded of just the films of Hal Hartley in general. So Hal, Hal Hartley, I haven't watched watched one of his films for a long time, but... My recollection is is a feeling that you don't know what's going to happen next. So you're just following characters. Um, it's very indie. It's not really subject to the conventions of you know your your big budget cinema. And I I like that. I like just to, you know to be kept guessing. Mm. Got some titles for, of um, Hal Hartley films that I might know because I can't think of any off the top of my head. Some of the ones that I'm thinking of are. Amateur and Henry Fool, they're sort of mid '90s mm. films. They're they're the I, ones that I most I most remember. But um, it, it's just the the vibe of his his type of filmmaking. Awesome. I I'm not familiar with Hal Hartley. That's some somebody I'm gonna have to look up. Maybe um the mid '90s was kind of my my day. I'd say that's, that's your era <laughs> right there. Awesome, awesome. Anything else, Doc? Any last comments? No, I don't think so. Enjoyed it. Um, enjoying the festival. Can't wait for the next one. Me too. Me too, Doc. And the next one is... We are going to see... One second. <laughs> the Arbors. The Arbors. That's so the So I think Murderberry Wynn was a um, a comedy. 
Yes. This one, I think it was in the narrative section. Which is, I guess, where they just put anything that's not a thriller or a comedy, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably probably drama in our on our um, shelves. Yeah. Uh, and this next one, The Arbors, I think is from the dark... Dark thriller. Dark, yep. dark places or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, that's right. So we're mixing up the genres and I'm looking forward to talking to you about this one next. Me too. All right. Talk to you soon, Doc. See you, Baron. <laughs> <laughs>